incomplete love saga. But was it? Or was it just a figment of someone's imagination? A murder uncovered a quarter of a century later. What took so long? Tune in for a case that has so many twists and turns. It's the case of Stephanie Lazarus, right now, on Love and Murder. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Love and Murder, the weekly true crime podcast discussing relationships gone terribly wrong, where our motto is, you're either someone's last love or their first murder. I am your host, Kai, and our show discusses true crime cases told in the form of a story with mystery and suspense. In today's episode, we're talking about a case of protect and serve, Loyalty to the badge or revenge for a heartbreak is a vow enough to compete with true love. We're talking a love triangle that shocked everyone. But first, I wanted to remind you to head on over to our exclusive group at patreon.com forward slash love and murder. What we have coming up is a getting to know the host episode and an episode of crazy crime. So insane you won't believe these cases are even true www.patreon.com forward slash love and murder. Now on to the show. Friends with benefits. This term is often used to describe people who are buddies, but occasionally sleep together. No strings attached, no emotional commitment, nothing. Well, that's not always the case. As you probably know, one person always ends up complicating things. In this case, we're going to talk about one such couple where things went a bit too far. Let's wind the clock back to 1978, Los Angeles. The year Dawn of the Dead and Halloween came out. How many of y'all went and saw that? LA was all palm trees, lights, and homicides. 18-year-old Stephanie Eileen Lazarus was a freshman at UCLA, Unlike most teens, Stephanie was extremely focused on her health and fitness. Passionate about exercising and remaining fit, she used to run and even trained in combat. She played for the junior varsity women's basketball team and was described as athletic and agile. Majoring in political science, Stephanie was a well-spoken and successful individual. One thing, well, let me put it this way. One thing people said, I don't want to say one thing I said, people described her as not really attractive. It's not that she was bad looking, but she wasn't what people would call beautiful. She was just a plain Jane. They did also say she had beautiful brown hair and a pleasant smile. So these are not my words, so don't come after me. Just saying what is said in the research. Stephanie, like most young people, loved to party. At one such party, she met a guy named John Rudin. At the party, and even after, John and Stephanie couldn't stop talking and enjoyed each other's company. Turned out that he lived at Dykstra Hall, UCLA's dorm on and off campus. John was a fitness enthusiast just like Stephanie. The two really got along well and had a lot in common. He was studying mechanical engineering at UCLA, so the two of them saw each other often. For two years, the two remained friends, sometimes flirtatious, sometimes not. And shortly after that, it's unclear when, Stephanie and John ended up sleeping together. Some say it was after graduation, but it wasn't clearly stated in my research, so we just know sometime they slept together. Anyway, it was just a hookup. Neither of them wanted anything more from the other. Or so they said. While John thought they were just friends, Stephanie, on the other hand, hoped for more. She would sometimes steal his clothes as he showered or snap naked pictures of him while he was asleep. He never took any of that seriously and just laughed it off. In 1983, John graduated and got a job at Micropolis, a hard drive manufacturing company, while Stephanie surprised everyone by applying and getting selected to the police academy. By this time, the two had known each other for like five years now, meeting off and on and off and on. You know how life gets in the way. Sometimes they didn't speak for a long time. Sometimes they were buddy-buddy, but 
off and on for five years. But Stephanie knew John's family well and was considered a close personal friend of the family. So she was basically like all around them a lot. As the two kept it casual, their friends considered it an open relationship and had gotten used to seeing them when they were together and had gotten used to seeing them when they were apart. It just wasn't a big deal. It was just Stephanie and John being Stephanie and John. You know some people like that. So friends didn't think too much about it when they saw John with a beautiful blonde woman. Sherry Rasmussen was described as being pretty with golden hair, a charming smile, six foot tall, a good athletic build, and had a cute little pointy chin. John met her in 1984 at a party. After getting into nursing college at only 16 years old, that's very impressive. Sherry's career was on a fast track, and by her late 20s, she would become the director of nursing at Glendale Adventist Medical Center, giving lectures on nursing and basically being the face of a successful nursing profession. Wow, she really was on a fast track. John and Sherry's romance was fast paced as well. I guess she didn't do anything slow. What he didn't realize is that by this time was that Stacy had developed serious feelings for him. Now, this was weird because they hadn't seen each other in like months, which was basically normal for them. You know, busy schedules, the life of an adult. Like I said, you know, they hadn't seen each other. But even with the time apart, Stephanie had this idea in her head and she still ended up having feelings for him. Now, they often, well, let me rephrase that. She often met with him to have sex. So he really wasn't expecting her to do something that was like girlfriendish, I guess. So to his surprise, in September of 1984, Stephanie decided to throw him a surprise 25th birthday party. She got everyone they knew together and surprised him. Now, at the party, she started hearing rumblings and whisperings and stuff about some woman named Sherry. And she's like, who is this Sherry? Who are you talking about? So she was listening to what everyone was saying and asked around. And that's when she realized that John was in a serious relationship. Stephanie asked John why he didn't tell her and why didn't they ever get together? Like instead of getting with this Sherry, you know, I'm here. So why didn't we get together? John's defense was that he and Stephanie had never been serious And also, Stephanie never said anything to him about it. You know, I didn't know how you felt. I thought we were just friends. I thought we liked how it was. I thought you were doing your thing and I was doing my thing. And I like our relationship like this. We're friends. I don't want to lose that friendship. Plus, to top it all off, we barely see each other. So I don't understand what the big deal is. And then, you know, during life, I met Sherry and we have a lot in common. We see each other a lot. It was made clear from the beginning what we were trying to do, and I developed feelings for her. That's just what happened. I'm not trying to be mean, but that's just what happened. So Stephanie said she understood, but in reality, her heart was broken. But it would get broken even more because within a year, John and Sherry got engaged and he bought her a BMW as an engagement present. Wow. Who who got a car as an engagement present? Raise your hand in the comments below (laughs) or let me know in the comments below what you ever got as an engagement present in addition to your ring. Is that a thing? Stephanie didn't take it well at all. In fact, she was inconsolable. I mean, personally, I don't understand how they weren't even together. And this is like a year and some time later. How are you still hung up on him? Like he told you what it was. He's not trying to lead you on. I don't understand like how this is devastating to you. By August, she made it clear to his family how she felt about him. Dude, really? I mean, I guess it only took seven years for her to tell everybody how she felt. Seven years and a proposal. She told John's mom, quote, I'm truly in love with John. And the past year has really torn me up. I wish it didn't end the way it did. And I don't think I'll ever understand his decision. End quote. End the way it did? What what ended? 
Anyways, at this time, Stephanie had finally made it to the police force and was an officer at the LAPD, Los Angeles Police Department. But despite the strides that she'd made in her life and her success professionally, she was incredibly depressed. You know, controversial state statement. There are some people who are just bent on keeping themselves in a dark place, no matter how good everything is going around them. And no, I'm not talking about people who are dealing with depression. I'm talking about people who decide to keep themselves in the dumps. You know what I'm talking about? Do y'all know people like that? I know people like that. Everything is negative. Even, even if everything's going well, it's still negative. In Stephanie's journal, she wrote, quote, I really don't feel like working. I found out that John is getting married, end quote. One day she called John and begged him to rethink this marriage to Sherry. Because of their years of friendship, John didn't want to hurt her feelings and he tried everything he could to make her feel better. They agreed to meet at his condo to possibly give Stephanie some sort of closure. I mean, I don't know what kind of closure you need, but okay. Just he's thinking anything to help her get over the situation. When she got there again, she's crying. She won't stop crying. You know, that ugly crying face. That's what's going on here. And she told him she loved him and John felt bad, but I mean, what could he do? He, he's not, he's not in love with Sher uh, with Stephanie. He's with Sherry. This is who he loves. This is who he wants to marry. He talked to Stephanie already. She's still crying. Like, I don't understand what more you want from me. And no matter what he did, no matter what he said, we're still going to be friends. This isn't going to stop us from being friends, you know, blah, blah, blah. She just wouldn't stop crying. Finally, Stephanie asked him to have sex with her one last time, quote, for old time's sake and quote, closure. I don't understand how having sex with someone you're in love with is giving you closure. I don't understand this mindset. I mean, I, I do basically is she just wanted to have sex with him, but I don't understand his decision though, which was he agreed just in his mind, anything to get her to stop crying. Like guys, I'm gonna tell you right now, that is not the answer because then you could lose your fiance, the one that you should be caring about. So to get her to stop crying, you decide to cheat on your fiance. And then what? Now Stephanie's okay. And then you go home to your fiance. I guess what happens in darkness usually comes out in life. I know the uh, in light, I know the quote is always comes out in light, but I'm going to say usually. So if your fiance were to find out now your fiance is crying. So I don't understand the logic behind this decision. But hey, when she got home, Stephanie, she woke up her roommate, Mike Hargraves, a fellow police officer, and told him everything. She said he was going to marry someone else and suggested the two do, quote, buddy sit-ups together to make her feel better. I would literally have punched her in her throat. Like you woke me up from sleep to cry about some dude. That's not even your dude. And then you want me to exercise straight from, from sleep. Okay. We're not supposed to be violent, right? <laughs> so Mike said, okay, let's do buddy sit-ups, which wasn't odd to him because, you know, Stephanie was like an exercise fanatic. So this kind of fit what she would do. Just don't pull me into your shit. I'm sleeping. Leave me sleeping. Work out if you want, but leave me asleep. I'll work, out, I'll work out when I wake up. Anyways, Stephanie claims that she felt better and was over the, quote, breakup. And I said, quote, because they weren't even in a relationship. The next day, John confessed to Sherry and begged her, quote, don't let this mess us up. Really? I think you should have thought about that earlier. I'm just, okay. He assured her that this was the only time this ever happened and would ever happen. John's plan kind of backfired, oh, duh, because Stephanie started showing up at the couple's condo with various excuses as to why she's here. I need some sugar. Hey, I need some milk. Like, didn't you pass a grocery store to get here? I, I, I don't understand. 
one day Stephanie showed up dressed in like the skimpiest, barely thereest <laughs> workout clothes that you could find. And her excuse this time for being here was to wax my skis. I'm dressed like it's summer and it is summer, but I need my skis waxed. You don't know when you're going to need these things. And I always need to have them ready because I don't know, even though it's the middle of summer in LA, we might have an avalanche. So John was like, couldn't you have taken this to a store and not me? I don't understand why you're here. And he kept trying to tell her, no, 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 no. But Stephanie was like, yes, 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 yes. I just need you to wax this, please. And for some reason, John still hadn't learned his lesson. And he said, okay, and took the skis. When Stephanie left, Sherry asked John about her. And what the hell is your relationship with her? Like, what's going on? Like, she's always here. And she lives clear across town. So I don't understand what's going on. And John was like, that's just Stephanie. She's my best friend. We've been friends for a while. And that's just Stephanie. It's nothing for you to worry about. You're my woman. I only love you. I'm not doing anything with her. I swear I'm not. It's just you. Now, I'm going to pause the story right here. How many of y'all would have put up with that? I'm just wondering. How many of y'all would have put up with that? Because I got to say, if this woman is, you know what? I want to say I would say I would put my foot down and say, if she's stopping by, I'm leaving. But knowing me, I'm not letting her win. So your option is she's gone. You control your friend or I'm gone. Then I'll see what your decision is. And based on your decision, I'll either stay or leave. That's what I would do. What do y'all think? What would you do? And I wouldn't, I wouldn't push someone to choose between their friends and me. It would have to take some crazy situation like this for me to be that kind of person. A couple of days later, Stephanie showed up again, this time in uniform and carrying her weapon to retrieve her wax skis while John was at work. So basically she came dressed as a cop with her weapon on her hip. John's not even at home. And she's like, Hey Sherry. Yeah. Can you hand me those skis over there, please? And Sherry said that she felt intimidated and didn't want to be alone with Stephanie. So after Stephanie left, she called her father, who she was close with, and his name was Nels Rasmussen. And she told him about Stephanie coming over and just like how she was dressed, how many times she comes over, like the excuses she makes up, this thing about the skis. And then this time she came over dressed in her blues and with her gun on her hip. And so she told her father about all of this. Now, as time went on, Sherry would realize that she would see Stephanie just randomly being around in public settings. Like, why are we at the same grocery store? Why is she looking at me from across the book aisle in the library? Why is she at this corner store when she lives 20 blocks away? You know, she was just around. So it just seemed like Stephanie was kind of stalking her. And then she told John, but John said, that's just Stephanie. I think you're, you're, not that you're making this up, but I think you're thinking too hard. You know, maybe she was in the area patrolling and this store was close to that route and she wanted to pick something up. I think you're overthinking this. It's just Stephanie. Stephanie loves you. She loves me. Stop overthinking. One day, Stephanie visited Sherry at work to tell her that things were not over between her and John. And she ended the conversation by saying, quote, if I can't have John, no one else will, end quote. Now, I wonder what John had to say about that one. But I guess Sherry wasn't going to let this break her up because despite all this drama that Stephanie was causing, the couple still had a really rock solid relationship. They were always together, taking pictures, holding hands, being all lovey dovey and everything like that. I think this was just a little bump in the road for them. And I don't think she's uh, one of those crazy people that would really let it affect her. But I think she still was just worried about Stephanie as who could blame her. What's this crazy woman doing here? In November of 1985, they got married and lived in a condo on Balboa Boulevard in Van Nuys. Life moved on. 
And the now 29-year-old Sherry became director of nursing at Glendale Adventist Medical Center and had a lot of managerial responsibilities. In her free time, she attended aerobics class, uh, spoke to her sister, you know, I guess went back to work, just the basic routine of life. It just became a routine. In the two years she had known John, the two had managed to build a lifetime of memories together. They were happily married and blissfully in their own little world, as happily married people usually are. Stephanie was also climbing up the ranks as an officer of the law, and it appeared to John that things had settled down. However, this is love and murder after all. On the morning of February 24th, 1986, the three-month newly married Sherry was supposed to give a motivational speech at her hospital. However, she'd hurt her back working out a couple of days ago, and she told John she was just going to go ahead and call in sick. So John was like, okay, I understand. Take care, rest, you know, put some, a heating pad on it, take a hot shower, whatever, you know, just rest yourself. And he kissed her goodbye and went to work. Around 9.45 a.m., a neighbor noticed the Rudings garage door was open and there was no car inside. Assuming the couple went out and forgot to shut the door, the neighbor went about her day. At 10 a.m., John made the first call of many calls of the day, but Sherry didn't answer the phone, which was kind of weird. Her sister's calls also went unanswered. The neighbor who noticed that the garage door was open was with her husband when two men, and according to reports, people are thinking it's probably gardeners, handed her a purse that they'd found. It turned out to be Sherry's purse. And a maid cleaning a unit nearby claimed she heard something that sounded like a fight and that someone fell down or something broke at 12.30 p.m. that day. So to the neighborhood, this sounded like regular gossip and nothing too serious. So the neighbor just assumed it was a domestic abuse and went about her business. That evening, when John returned home, he instantly knew something was wrong. The garage door was wide open and there was broken glass in the driveway. Sherry's BMW was missing, which was weird because she never went out without letting him know her plans. And far as he knew, she wasn't going to work. The answering machine wasn't on either, and the two always turned it on when nobody was home. Y'all don't know about that. Back in the day, we didn't just have automatic voicemail. There was something called an answering serv- an answering machine that was a separate machine from the house phone that you actually hooked onto the phone and you either turned it on. So if it's on when the phone rang and you didn't pick it up, then you would get voicemail or back in the day it was called answering machine or it was off so that if you're home and, you know, You just answered the phone. Or if you didn't pick up, just nothing happened. It either rang and 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 rang until the person just decided to hang up. Or they had the answering machine on and it went to the answering machine. Or they answered the phone. Those were the only three options. There was no option where it just automatically went to voicemail. And we didn't even have the word voicemail back then. (laughs) So he proceeded throughout the house to search for his wife And when he got to the living room, he noticed there was broken glass from a porcelain vase on the floor. And then he saw a bloody handprint on the burglar alarm, but like on the panic button part of the alarm. And then he saw Sherry dead, clad in nothing but a bathrobe, nightgown and underwear. She was sprawled across the living room floor, having been shot three times. There were defensive wounds all over her body and a large bruise that was caused by the muzzle of a gun. So that means the gun was literally on her when it went off. John immediately called 911 while covering her body with a blanket. He realized that the quilted blanket, the one he was covering her with, was what was used to silence the gunshot. So this person wrapped the gun in a blanket so that it would be used as a silencer. Officers arrived on the scene and they gathered a ton of evidence. A video cassette recorder and other electrical devices were piled up like 
it was just in a corner piled up that showed like somebody was planning to rob the place and they were getting everything together, but then they panic and left things in a hurry. So they were thinking that people came in to burglarize the place and maybe Sherry came down and scared them. And then to top it off, the house was ransacked. So drawers drawers were open, you know, stuff was just all over the place. So it could be that they broke in. Sherry heard the noise, came down, scared them. They did this and then bolted. Bruises on Sherry's body indicated that she had fought back and even made it to the burglar alarm. And if you looked at her wrists, there were bruises on there that indicated that someone had tried to tie her up at some point during the struggle. Investigators also found a bite mark on Sherry's arm. Wow, a whole bike mark? And swabbed it for DNA. However, this is still the 80s and there was no real proper way to read like small samples of DNA. So they sent the swab into storage. The detective on the case, Lyle Mayer, pointed out that a bloody thumbprint on the video cassette recorder had Sherry's blood on it. The burglar was wearing gloves, but interestingly, they had stacked the equipment after killing Sherry and then left in a hurry. So this didn't make sense to him. And the way that they figured out they stacked the equipment after was because of this thumbprint you could tell that this didn't happen before the murder. So all of this just isn't adding up. He ruled out John as a suspect after just numerous interrogations and the investigation. Nels, her father, and Loretta, her mother, told the police about Stephanie's stalking and harassment. Shortly before her death, his daughter had called again and confided in him her fear that Stephanie was following her on the streets. Now, although this information was given, officers didn't question John about Stephanie, and he never thought about her since Sherry had stopped complaining about her to him, which, yeah, because you weren't taking it seriously, so she was talking to her family about it and not you. So that was that when it came to the information about Stephanie. That was it. Once cleared... Heartbroken John quit his job and moved away from L.A. He just couldn't take it anymore. The police still treated this case as a burglary, especially after a similar breaking and entering incident happened soon after Sherry's murder. The suspect used a 38 caliber, much like the one that fired the three shots into Sherry. But then again, why would a burglar take his time to muffle the gunshots and shoot at such a close range if it was an accidental shooting? If anyone's paying attention, things just aren't adding up. And clearly, for some reason, the LAPD wasn't paying attention. Lyle Mayer's partner, Steve Hooks, found the bite marks odd, as bites are typically associated with females during a fight, but maybe he thought he was stereotyping women and didn't pursue it later. Now, in the 80s, there was a huge crack epidemic. LA was struck with gang wars and other crime, and the police force was, like, really busy. You gotta go back and look to see what LA was like back in the 80s. While Sherry's parents put up a reward to identify the capture of the burglar, Her father wrote to the chief of police pleading with him to look into the matter and saying Stephanie was possibly involved. At least talk to her. It's important to state here that the detectives did not take this man seriously. They told him that he watched too much television and made dismissive comments. Then they just altogether stopped taking his phone calls. Like, what? First of all, how dare you tell this man he watched too much TV because he's trying to help with the case? And how dare you ignore him? It is your job. And I'm pretty sure if he thought that the evidence came up to burglary, he would have just left it at that. But it didn't. And he's not stupid. Nels questioned officers about how could the six feet tall Sherry be overpowered by a burglar? Also, don't come at me for how I say burglar. (laughs) I have never been able to say it properly. Anyway, she was in great physical shape and wouldn't have been an easy tackle. They said, yeah, you're right, you're right. But I think what happened was the struggle just lasted a long time, maybe an hour and a half about. 
And so I'm asking, like, they fought with this person for an hour and a half and then just left everything? Do you think that's the case? Like, anybody would do that? If you came in the house, you wasted an hour and a half fighting with someone to the point where you you finally were, were able to, quote, subdue them however you did it. Then you just left the house with nothing that you came for? That doesn't even make sense. In 1992, when crime in L.A. was at its peak, Nels was still working hard at getting someone to listen to him. And by 1993, DNA testing technology had finally advanced enough that it was possible to get all the evidence checked for DNA. However, Nels tried to get this to happen, and he was turned away, even though he offered to pay for the test. He was like, look, police. You don't have to pay for this. I know you're all busy. I know your budgets are tied up. I will pay out of, for this out of my own pocket. And they still said no. Now, where was Stephanie all this time? Because Sherry's out of the picture. So she's not walking around trying to find out where she is. She's not showing up unannounced at the house to try and threaten her. What has she been doing in all this time? Well, while all this was going on, Stephanie reported her off-duty weapon as stolen. And then she went ahead and opened her own PI firm while she still worked for the LAPD. She ended up rising through the ranks in the PD. And in 1987, she earned a lot of medals, including a gold medal at the World Police and Fire Games in San Diego. In 1989, she ran into John, but didn't once ask him about Sherry. John, for his part, eventually moved on. Now, based on my research, I'm estimating like more than three years later is when he got remarried and started rebuilding his life. Detective Mayer's notes show that John had double checked with him to make sure if Stephanie was involved or whether there was any connecting evidence between Stephanie and this. And they said no, but they also failed to mention what her father was doing and her, that his insistence was on them investigating Stephanie's investigating her for stalking and investigating her for this, what happened to Sherry. So they didn't even tell him that. Unfortunately, detective Mayer eventually retired and the new detective assigned to the case failed to follow officer Mayer's files on this case. In 1993, after a glowing performance at Drug Abuse Resistance Education and Internal Affairs, Stephanie finally made detective. And if you're following the dates, this was around the time that Nels was actually trying to get that swab tested again because DNA evidence, DNA, um, the DNA science had gotten more advanced. By 96, Stephanie was married to a fellow officer, Scott Young, and the two adopted a daughter. Stephanie moved back to her hometown, Simi Valley, and became an instructor at the police academy of the Valley. She was even honored for her work in the art of the forgery department. The LAPD formed the Department for Investigating Cold Cases in the late 90s to investigate potential leads from newer DNA testing methods. In Sherry's case, the evidence collected from her home was in that department. However, it wasn't until 2004 that the evidence saw the light of day. Criminalist Jennifer Francis was granted access to not only the evidence, but the entire case, which was something that wasn't usual for someone in her position. She was able to analyze a swab collected from Sherry's bite mark, but she noticed something weird. First, some of the evidence was missing. This included vital pieces that might contain the killer's DNA. Apparently, it was collected in 1993 by another detective. Luckily, one thing that was left behind, the swab of saliva that was in storage. Unable to find a match in the combined DNA index system database, she could derive it came from a female and literally that's all she, she could find out. But that was a huge thing because that meant that the burglary theory had just been disapproved. Funny thing is, she also found a note in the file about a, quote, third-party female who had been a harassing Sherry at her home and workplace shortly before her death. So Jennifer got all of this and ran to her supervisor 
and told him all of this. And he said, quote, oh, you mean the LAPD detective? He stated that she was the victim's husband's ex and was also a respectable LAPD officer. And she wasn't part of this investigation at all. Nobody was investigating her. This is no. So basically, he dismissed the idea of foul play and insisted that Sherry's death was the cause of burglary. End of story. Case closed, Johnson. Stop asking me any questions. Move along. As no other detective wanted to pursue the case, the evidence went back into the cold case files. And this is both amazing and shocking. The case went cold again until 2009 when crime in LA had quieted down enough for officers to start beginning to, you know, or start beginning, start looking into cold cases and missing person. Detective Jim Nuttall and Pete Barba reviewed Sherry's files. They quickly debunked the burglary series. Well, Jennifer had already done that and started the investigation over from the beginning, which is a smart way to work if you're coming in behind someone else's work. I hate coming in behind someone else's work. They decided to investigate this as a murder instead of a burglary, which would make any detective look at this case completely differently now. Now you're looking at different angles that you wouldn't if you had thought it was burglary. From all the evidence, they got a list of four to five female su suspects. And as they started to call about each subject, they realized that one of them literally worked right next door to them. By this time, Stephanie was one of two female detectives on the only existing full-time unit devoted to art forgery and actually had media attention when her and her partner recovered a stolen statue of Carthray Circle. I don't know what that is. She had learned to paint, was clearly involved in Los Angeles Women's Police Officers Association, and even helped organize childcare for officers' families. She was also a great neighbor in the Simi Valley, and she made her neighbors chocolate-covered cherries and handmade soap at the end of every year. Was she always like this? So obviously, being that she literally worked right across the hall, they knew each other as colleagues. And so Jim and Pete had to basically proceed with this investigation with caution to avoid tipping off their subject. As a matter of fact, on that list that I told you they got together, they ranked her fifth, but they ranked her as, quote, the least promising of their five potential suspects. Things got a bit interesting when they found out that she and John had dated and broken up just a summer before Sherry's murder. They theorized and asked the question of how an officer could murder someone. Obviously, it would be calculated and smart as officers have been trained on MOs and what to look for to catch criminals. So basically, an officer would literally know how to stage a crime. They started going over her life in the mid 80s and they found out that she owned a Smith and Wesson model 49, 38 caliber. And this was the weapon that she had claimed was stolen. She was also off duty the day of the crime, which kind of backed Jim and Pete's theory about an off duty police officer. They also found notes that there were complaints of her stalking Sherry. Now, the question is, why hadn't this, this complaint ever been investigated? I, I don't understand what's going on here. Referring to Stephanie only as, quote, number five, the detectives worked behind closed doors or after hours and never revealed any details or progress to anyone. Stephanie's husband worked in the commercial crimes division, so, you know, they really had to keep this like close to the chest. Hush, hush. Don't talk to anybody. Also, Stephanie and her husband had friends in the department and people were always talking about how vivacious and supportive she was. But for John and Pete, she was suspect numero uno now. During the investigation and unbeknownst to Stephanie, some detectives had secretly followed her one day and just basically tried to keep a close watch on her. Then they actually caught a break when they retrieved a cup that she'd thrown away. They took it in for testing against the evidence, which was the DNA um, that they had from the crime scene. And the results found a match. 
After all these years, Stephanie Lazarus's DNA matched the DNA found on the bite mark. And this is something we already figured out. Now, her arrest had to be planned very, very carefully. They didn't want any rats telling on her and making her a flight risk. Rob Bubb, the detective supervisor in Van News, carefully let his superior officers in on the case, including Chief William Bratton and prosecutors from L.A. While the case was transferred to Robbie Homicide Division, they had to be careful because the Art Theft Bureau, where Stephanie worked, was in this particular division. On the day of the arrest, a shit ton load of officers, yes, that's a, that's a unit of measurement, were summoned before sunrise and briefed about the situation, only knowing about a search warrant outside of the city, but no names were given. They were taken to an area to wait near Stephanie's home in Simi Valley. Then, detectives who didn't know Stephanie personally were selected from the RHD and were called to a local park center. That, in my opinion, was a smart move. Nothing else. That was a smart move. An unsuspecting Stephanie was brought into an interrogation room and detectives deceived her by claiming that there was a suspect who wanted to talk about art theft. Later, when she felt, you know, secure and like everything was good, they told her that they were simply trying to close up that Sherry Rasmussen case and that just somehow her name was connected to the files. She was asked if she knew John Reuter, and she acted like she hadn't thought of him in a long time. It took her a while to actually answer this question, though. And the funny thing is, she was breathing heavily and you could literally see she was nervous. And I'll actually have the interrogation video in our Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash love and murder. So if you wanted to go ahead and see that, you can go to our Patreon. After dismissing this accusation, she told them that she needed that she needed an attorney but the detectives proceeded with caution, careful not to set her off and invoke her right to remain silent, I guess. But I'm kind of, okay, I'm kind of confused. Isn't the interrogation supposed to stop as soon as the suspect asks for an attorney? So they kept talking to her. They asked her about other things that's going on with her, you know, just trying to distract her with friendly conversation. The interrogation actually lasted for over an hour and eventually detectives came back to the matter of hand. So they were talking to her like this whole time. And then they just asked her for a DNA sample. And she said, nope, and got up and left the room. And that was it. They arrested her and charged her with murder because if she had nothing to hide, I think she wouldn't have said no. Upon searching her apartment, they found her journal from the 80s that spoke volumes about her love for John, something she had downplayed during her interrogation. Like, yeah, I know John, he's a friend, you know, she kind of downplayed that I'm in love with John type of stuff. Her computer had also searched John's name during the late nineties. News of Stephanie's arrest actually shocked the police force. She was a friendly, dependable colleague and nobody could understand why she was being arrested. Held in the L.A. County Jail, she was actually allowed an early retirement from the force, which is unjust considering that she's an alleged murderer. So when you are offered retirement, that means you'll get your pension as opposed to if she was fired. So basically, she's not going to work anymore. She's retired, but she still gets money every month. When her bail hearing was held six months later, six months later, mind you, due to a horrible investigation, how long has she been allowed to be free? Years? And you're still giving her six months? Okay. Anyway, six months later, bail hearing, Judge Robert J. Perry set her bail at $10 million in cash, way beyond what the defense was suggesting. The evidence against the ex-police officer was strong, so she was at risk of fleeing the country, so she was a flight risk. After many months in jail, her brother, Stephen Lazarus, filed a complaint that she wasn't receiving cancer treatment. Wait, what? Cancer? 
when did she get cancer? And then I guess they asked the same question because she said it was an unspecified cancer. Wow. She also appealed her bail to be set at a reasonable rate. There's also a video of, of her brother's appeal also in our Patreon. By October 2009, the defense lawyer Overland tried to get the entire case dismissed, claiming initial investigators had failed, not his client. Once again, I really, I, I, I really need to have that episode of what lawyers think when they're defending, for instance, a murder suspect. I mean, I had a brief one. It covered it a little bit, but I just don't think it's as in depth as I wanted it to be. So I got to do some more research on that. Absurd as it was, this was actually a good defense. He included missing evidence, Sherry's blood toxology report, and even a polygraph test that claimed John had failed. But what he failed to mention was John had willingly given his DNA to find justice for his dead wife, and the DNA didn't come back that had anything to do with John. He probably failed because he was like, distraught and nervous. He knows that the first person they look at is the husband or the wife. You know what I'm saying? So the case went on into 2010 and the defense claimed the quality of evidence must have been degraded in 23 years. You think 23 years? During the trial, a lot more evidence was missing, including Nell Rasmussen's interview, records of transcripts, and everything except that note in Officer Mayer's file about a former girlfriend harassing Sherry. Interesting. So literally half the case was gone. But obviously nobody's going to say, hey, the police department are trying to cover something. Nobody's going to say that. Nels and Loretta, though, were like, no, I'm going to talk. So they testified about giving interviews to the police, about the transcripts, and about everything they could. John's sister showed the letter Stephanie had written to her mother in August 1985, obsessing over John and Sherry. It included details about the physical nature of their relationship. Then John got up and he testified, crying while he was testifying, saying that him and Stephanie had only slept together 20 or 30 times between 1981 to 1983, and they never dated, and she was just a friend and nothing more. He heard everything that was being accused. He got evidence of the uh, DNA on the bite mark, but he could have never imagined that Stephanie would do this to his wife. During the trial, Stephanie didn't make eye contact with John. She wouldn't even look at the screen when Sherry's photographs came up. She just sat there. And then just think about this. Imagine it. Two decades later, everything Nels had said turned out to be true. And then there's going to be a video of him asking why it took so long for the police department to look into Stephanie. I'm going to have that in the Patreon too. Now, during the trial, the events of February 24th, 1986 were finally revealed. What really happened to Sherry? Well, that morning after John had left, Stephanie, wearing gloves, had picked the lock and broken into the Rudin's home. As soon as Sherry saw her, she screamed and Stephanie shot her with a 38 caliber. She was careful, as we said before, to use her personal weapon so that she can keep her police issued gun safe, avoiding any investigation. The first shot hit a window because Sherry had run away like really fast. But Stephanie ran after her and tackled her. And although Sherry was a much larger woman, Stephanie was a police officer, so she was trained to fight and subdue people. Uh, Sherry, on the other hand, was a fighter. She was like, yeah, I know I'm not as skilled as you in fighting, but look. So she ended up getting Stephanie in a sleeper hold. And then that's when Stephanie bit her hand just to get her to let go, which she did. And as soon as Sherry let go, Stephanie jumped up and grabbed the porcelain vase and smashed it over Sherry's head. And then once Sherry was basically unconscious, she took the butt of her gun and smashed it into her face also. Then she carefully wrapped the barrel of her gun in a blanket to muffle the sounds and shot Sherry three times in the heart and the face. Damn. Satisfied that Sherry was finally gone, she quickly made the scene look like a robbery gone wrong since she knew basically what that would look like. 
She knocked over furniture, pulled out drawers, and stacked a video cassette recorder and CD player in the way they basically taught you that a burglar would stack something if they were intending on stealing it. So basically, the way she went in is the way she went out. There was no physical evidence, no hair, fiber, blood, nothing except for the bite mark on Sherry's arm. Stephanie was convicted of first-degree murder in 2012. Then two lawsuits came out of that. Jennifer Francis, remember the criminalist? She claimed the LAPD hid evidence and failed to investigate when she insisted they investigate Officer Lazarus, a.k.a. Stephanie. She also claimed she feared retaliation and harassment, trying to report this to superiors, and the harassment actually continued into 2023, despite Stephanie being behind bars. The other was of misconduct filed by Nails and Loretta, which were Sherry's parents, And they filed a lawsuit of the police department basically brushing them aside aside and saying that all you do is watch TV and calm yourselves. Anyway, Stephanie was sentenced to 27 years to life in prison and will be eligible for parole in the year 2034. This was further discussed in a press conference due to the nature of the crime and an officer's involvement to ensure and make sure the public kept and had trust in the police force. And videos for all of this are, you guessed it, in our Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash love and murder. And that is the case of Stephanie Lazarus. Sherry is dead. Stephanie was allowed to literally live her life. And Sherry's parents and widow have been going through such a tough time for so many years. So what did y'all think of this one? Justice delayed or justice denied? Like it literally took authorities a quarter of a century to solve this case. If they just listened to Sherry's father, maybe it could have sped up the process. Or maybe they just didn't want to listen to Nels because of who was being accused. Now, I know I mentioned this so many times in the show, but I'm going to mention it once more. Don't forget to visit us on Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash love and murder to become an exclusive member of the Lamb community. You get commercial free full length early release episodes of Love and Murder, as well as some extras of whatever case we're covering. Like with this episode, our Patreon Lambs will get so many extra videos to back up the case as well as pictures. You can get this too, along with bonus content like cases about love obsession or cases about the craziest crime or serial killer corner. You also get host stories, behind the scenes, and so much more. We have options started at only $1 a month, so come on over. But the best tier is $5 and above. www.patreon.com forward slash love and murder. Find all our social media in the link in the show notes below. And as always, we end each episode by reminding you that it's, say it with me now, all love and no murder, y'all. Bye. Bye.